Welcome to the Believer's Voice of Victory from Kenneth Copeland Ministries. Download the notes at kcm.org slash notes. And in whatever dispensation you live, your job is to do God's will. That settles it. That's right. We are the body of Christ, and we are to do His will in this earth. I know. As a believer, you are called to pray. Together, we can accomplish God's will in the earth. Join Gloria Copeland and Billy Brim today as they encourage the body of Christ to take a stand of faith and receive more from God, next on The Believer's Voice of Victory. Hello, everybody. I'm Gloria Copeland, and welcome to The Believer's Voice of Victory. Sister Billy's back with us today, and boy, does she have some interesting info for you. The days, the times, praying in the end of days. Hallelujah. So, Billy, we welcome you. Thank we're you. glad you're here. And Thank you very we're much. We're excited to hear about all this. We want to be totally prepared. Yes, we do. And be doing what we're supposed to be and doing. be obedient. Mm -hmm. Amen. Get God getting use out of us. That's right. Um, we've, we've entitled this Praying in the End of Days. What are the end of days? What is that term? It is actually the literal Hebrew for what the King James translates the latter days. Throughout the Bible, it talks about the latter days. But the really, what the Hebrew says is the end of days. And where does that come from? It comes from, we're going to put a chart up for you. It comes from what God told Moses. Uh, when Moses was given the Torah, when he went up on the mountain... He was given the written Torah, the written Word of God, but he was also given the oral Word of God. And uh, then he was to give that to Joshua. Joshua gave it to the next one, the next one, the next one. And what he told Moses was that he gave to Adam a six-day work week, a thousand years being a day and a day being a thousand years. Mm -hmm. That he had a thousand, he worked in six days and he gave man six days to work. And then at the end will come the, um, the, the millennium, yeah. the millennial reign. So um, these days are divided into three That's segments. The first day, day one, a thousand years, and day two, a yellow and orange you're seeing there on the chart. And those are called the days of chaos. Mm, six days of chaos? Uh, two days of chaos. Two, uh, two days. There are six days, 6,000 years since Adam. I'm and for my now you don't have a copy of this. I'll well, just share right there with you. It is up there on the on the monitor, but the yellow and the orange is the first two days. Those are the days of chaos. Then, on this day came the Torah. Men lived without the written word of God for two thousand years. Wouldn't that be terrible? Oh, mama. And then God gave the law at Sinai. You know uh, when Moses came up. So the next two days are called the days of Torah or the days of the law brown and orange on your chart. And then, according to the prophecy, the Messiah is to come on the fourth day. Well, and then the last two days are called uh, the last, the end of days or the days of Messiah. So we know that he did come and it's been two days. Now it's been 2,000 years that he did come. And he's coming again at the end of this six days. So the latter days or the end of days or those, the green and the blue on this chart that you're looking at. 2,000 years since Jesus came and of course he's coming again. Then when he comes, he'll set up an earthly kingdom and the purple is a thousand year reign of Jesus Christ when he sets up the millennial reign. Hallelujah. So we are living in Joel chapter, uh, it talks about the end of days and uh, and, oh, excuse me, in, in Acts, it talks about the end of days. And Peter said these signs, he says these are the latter days. Well, he was at the beginning of the latter days, Peter. Now we're at the end of them. So we're right here at the end of days. We're going to be here when an age change comes. And um, so God is working in these Hallelujah. end of days. We're at the end. But Satan is working. 
And so a lot of the darkness that you're seeing in this world is mm. what well, Satan is bringing forth. He's desperate. He is desperate because he's fighting for his survival. So, and he's fighting a losing battle. He's fighting a losing battle. And God's got an army. And we're it. That's right. He's got more than one army. He's got angel armies, hailstone armies, army of Israel. But the church is an army of God. Amen. And we're the ones with the authority in the earth. Uh, at the beginning of the year 2015, you know, the, the basis of our ministry is a church in Collinsville, Oklahoma. You got this on the next page, Gloria. Well, help me keep up. I'm helping you keep up here. Whiz, whiz. Uh, near the first of the year in 2015, Pastor Lee Morgans is the senior pastor of a church, and my son Chip and his wife are associate pastors. And they presented to their congregation what they call green cards at the Glorious Church Fellowship in Collinsville, Oklahoma. Now, I know the original idea came from Keith Moore because Chip used to go to Keith's church when he was living in Branson, Faith Life Church in Branson. And what Pastor Keith has the people do in the beginning of the year, and now what uh, they're doing at the beginning of the year in Collinsville, on the green card, I'm just going to tell you about what they've got. On one side of the green, it, and it's based on write the vision and make it plain. So they want people to write their visions down on paper at the beginning of the year and then to see how much their faith brought in by the end of the year. Well, that's interesting. So on one side of the green card, they have written, what more I can do for God in the upcoming wow, that's year. that's good. That's a whole side. Then on the back side, they've invited it, they divided it into two parts, and the top part is what I need. So that's what you need. Maybe you need a place to live. Maybe you need a car. Maybe you need something to help you do more for God. Yes, that's right. Money to help you do more for God. That's right. So what I want. And Brother Keith always encourages the people. And, and he said, you just write down what you want if money were no object. Just what you want. Hallelujah. So you've got three divisions here. That's good. What more I can do for God in the upcoming year? What I need and what I want. So I'm watching by internet, you know, this, this church service. It's archived and it's on in the mornings as well live. And I'm watching it and this thought comes to me, Holy Ghost thought. What does God need? What if God had a green card? And he wrote on there, what I need. Does God need anything? Some people think no. I remember seeing a man in Branson in it wearing a t-shirt. We have a lot of tourists. And it said, God doesn't need me. I need God. Well, that sounds religious, but it's foolishness. It's not true. You do need God, that's for sure. But God needs you too. There's so, a lot of people in the church that have been called, but have never answered. Right. And God needs all and of God us. And God needs them. That's right. He needs us. One of the calls that he calls us to is glory. He needs us to put on glory. Praise we'll talk God. about that later. Good. But does what does God need? So I went out to Prayer Mountain, and we have a lot of, you know, prayers that come out there every week, and I presented it to them. What does God need? I let them, you know, give forth their ideas. And I remember one woman and where she was sitting, and he, she said, he needs faith. He needs us to believe. And that is the truth. I see grace like this. I see it like an ocean above us. All the grace of God. All good. the goodness of God. And it is limited only by your capacity to receive His goodness. What does God need? Think about uh, Brother Hagen. Here was a sick little boy. Yes. And God needed him to he rise needed him. up to get healed and do what he ended up doing, teaching the word of faith. I mean, he brought that into all the church. Yes. It was a, God needed him, and he, he did. He needed that little boy to f understand Mark 11, 23. That's right. And Mark 11, 24. To pass that message on to all of us. Which is, you have what you say. That's right. And the Lord said to me recently, it's not come what may, it's come what you say. 
That's good, Billy. In your own life? That's right, that's right. It's not somebody's people. Case sera, sera. Whatever. Whatever happens, what happens. Whatever will be, will be. But that's not true. No. And, and that and brother that, Hagen that you talked about, he taught us it's not going to fall on you like ripe right cherries off, off of a tree. tree. That's right. <laughs> we got it. See, that's how you grace to, is. You have to take it. You have to. And you, how can you do it? By faith. That's right. And I see it like a great ocean above us, a great ocean of, of all God's goodness, yes. all God's grace. You get saved by grace. But what does it say in Ephesians 2, 8? By grace are you saved through faith. faith. And that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. God can give you the faith to get born again by. That's and then right. as you feed it and exercise it, then it grows and you can receive more from God. That's right. I tell you. There's no limit. There's no limit. No limit. To get his blessings to mankind. And God wants them to have those blessings. He is limited only by man's capacity to receive and we must receive his goodness through faith. I will never forget hearing Kenneth Copeland. This cleared a lot of things for me. I needed, you know, to know how to, how to pray. Because I was brought up in church. And I remember I used to get down and pray by my bedside. I remember one time we needed desperately more money. We had four little children expenses like you have. And I got down to pray for Kent to get a raise. I clean up my bedroom. I kneel down by the bread bed. And I said to the Lord, dear Lord, here's our bills. Dun, 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 dun. And I, we need Kent to get a raise. Here comes this thought. What about the starving children in India? <laughs> oh, yes, the starving children in India. Oh, God, how could I be so selfish? Please forgive me. You take care of the starving children in India, and I'll figure out a way to take care of these four children. Now that, I thought... That's pathetic. Isn't that pathetic? <laughs> isn't that pathetic? Oh, my word. You, you see, we have to know how to pray. And I thought, I don't know, surely I didn't think that. That's, it's really rather stupid. But we didn't know anything. But we didn't know any better. And here I thought, well, somehow it's going to take away from God and the starving children take in India. Out of the children's For mouth. God to give Kent, probably at that time, a $10 raise. You know, I'm talking back in the 70s. That's 60s. Actually, 60s. No I'm lie. talking 60s. Yeah. Then I heard Kenneth Copeland preach. And he said, God is not moved by need. He said, the devil creates need. And if God was moved by need, then the devil would be leading God around because he's the one that creates the needs. He's yeah. the reason the children are starving in India. Lack of light, not darkness. Because you <laughs> not, so because, money. not because I took a $10 raise. <laughs> <laughs> See? Oh, my. Tradition is such oh, a dog, isn't it? Yes. Oh, me. And so I had, the Lord showed me, it was like a black spot back there in my thinking that I had to get out of there by renewing my mind with the Word of God. But when I heard Ken Copeland preach this, God is moved only by your faith. And that's, that's right. the safe way that God that's can right. move. Then that way, we're all on a level here. We can, we can have faith and we can receive from God and the devil's not leading God around. Yes, you might have a need that the devil created, but the way you get out of that need is you pray whatsoever things you desire. Yes, when you that's pray, right. believe that God. you receive them and, and you shall have, have them. them. And we've proved it. Proven it we've proved it. Many, many, all of us have proved yes. it. Yes. So it's not come what may, it's come what you say. Mm -hmm. and, and Brother Hagin like taught us that. Mark eleven twenty three. you have what you say. And Mark mm -hmm. eleven twenty four. you have what you pray. But Brother Hagin said this, you can pray it or you can say it. But even if you just pray it, you still have to say it. You still have to keep your mouth in order. Yeah, that's right. Now, this is the kind of prayer, the prayer of faith 
that works for you and works for your family. And in that one basic prayer book that Brother Hagin's got, he talks about the different kinds of prayer. It's all prayer. But the Bible tells us in Ephesians to be praying with all kinds of prayer. Mm -hmm. It's all prayer, but it has different rules. Right. And uh, so there is the prayer that you, you can pray for the Copeland family, and I could pray for the Brim family, or me, myself, and I, whatever. But there's other kinds of prayer. And there are prayers where I cannot just say, President Obama will do this tomorrow. That'd be witchcraft. Yeah. You can't do that. I don't even know what President Obama should do tomorrow. So I have to enter into another kind of praying. The Lord told me, lift up the, those who are in authority. But for the problems of the earth right now, um, he needs... What does God need? So here we are. And, and, and the Lord presented that to me after the green cards. What do I need? Does God have a need? Yes. If it, to, to meet your individual needs, he's going to have to have your faith. Yes, that's right. But then it came to me, comes to me, God needs a body. He needs a body in the earth. Bless the Lord. And one morning, I got up in the morning praying, and a phrase came to me, mm -hmm. floating in, just like that one time when God said to me, it's not come what may, it's come what you say. I'm up in the morning, I'm sitting in my prayer chair, looking out my window, and this phrase comes to me, a body hast thou prepared for me. A body hast thou prepared for me. Mm -hmm. Well, I knew that that's in the scriptures. Yeah. But I also knew because the Lord kept, he kept impressing it on me. I knew that another layer of illumination of the meaning of that scripture was coming to me from God. You know, the Jews say this, that a scripture is like an onion. You have mm. its basic meaning. But then you can peel back a layer and there's another layer beneath it. And you can peel back another layer and there's another layer beneath it. So I knew that another layer of illumination was coming to me. In its basic meaning, I knew that that verse speaks of the anointed one, the Messiah. But this morning as I awoke, God was revealing to me that the church, the ecclesia, is prepared and is being further prepared for him. A body is being prepared for him, the church. A body through which he will work, through which he can bring his will, his plans into the earth yeah, so and stop the strategies of the enemy. A body is being prepared for him. That's okay. us. A he, vessel. A vessel. And he began preparing that body with the coming of Jesus. And he died his death, burial, and resurrection. He shed his blood. He took his blood before the Father. It was accepted for us. Then he moves to the right hand of the Father and becomes the head over the body, the church. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, that original scripture uh, that, that I was thinking of comes from Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 5. And that's going to be here on um, page, page 1. Of the body of Christ. You have the body of Christ? Yes. So. I'm glad to know you're dreaming about me. You know, I was Brother Wiseman. Oh. Yep. He, he said that. Me, yeah. Isn't that something? It is something. But you, but it was, but it was affected to me. It, it was attached Praise to me. Praise God. But this scripture in the English Standard Version, Hebrews 10, 5, reads like this. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said... Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. Yeah. Now, the King James translation translates it like this. For it is not possible, starting with verse 4, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you would not, but a body have you prepared for me. 
In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume mm-hmm. of the book. It is written of me. Why did he come? To do, to thy, do will. thy will, O God. Glory now he's to quoting God. Psalm 40, verse 6. Sacrifice, and, and this is Psalms 40, verse 6. Sacrifice and offering thou did not desire. Uh, mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then I said, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will. Glory so, in, when, And when he quoted that in Hebrews, he said, I come to do your will. God has a will. I delight to do He has that a will that he needs to get into the earth, but a, a man has to do it. A person has to do it. Jesus was that one. Now, Lucifer, think of what he did. In um, Isaiah, it is written, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How did it happen? And then it says, this is how it happened. Because you said, I will ascend into heaven. Mm-hmm. I will exalt my Lucifer throne above the stars that. of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Those are his five wills. Lucifer was the first to ever cross God's will. I will ascend over. My will will ascend over. Yes, God's over God's will. will. Yeah, that's what he's saying. So he came and he was the first one. You're right. He was the first one to cross God's will. Mm. God has a will. But then when Jesus came and God prepared a body for him to sacrifice, Jesus said, I come to do your will. Praise God. And in his coming to do thy will, then he was the death, burial, and resurrection, the shedding of the blood that allowed God to get a body in the earth. Yes. He's the head and we're the body. What's our job? To do God's will. To do God's will. And in whatever dispensation you live, your job is to do God's will. Mm -mm -mm. That settles it. That's right. We are the body of Christ and we are to do his will in this earth. Now, right now, we're at the end of days. So when God's calling you to do something, telling you to do something, moving on you to do something, you say, no, I don't want to do that. You're saying, I will not. You're acting like Satan. You're joining the wrong crowd. You know what Brother Copeland says? I'm sure you do, but I'll set for that. I've heard a few things. Go ahead. (laughs) Uh, I like it because he, he knows he's in the army of the Lord. And he stands at attention and salutes. And he said, I am at your command. That's right. We're the body of Christ we in the earth. The body of Christ. Now he needs us to say things. He needs us to pray That's things. Right. That's right. He said, you're one body. We'll talk more about it. Of course, the truth is that it's so good when you do what he says and so low when you try to do it yourself. You know, it's just night and day, good and evil, prosperity and poverty. Billy and I'll be right back. Don't miss it. We hope you enjoyed today's teaching from Kenneth Copeland Ministries. Be sure to get the notes at kcm.org slash notes. And remember, Jesus is Lord.